Well, uh, the, the thing is that I will first tell you the, what the situation is. The situation is um, not where we expected it to be, but recently the Indian Prime Minister Manmohan Singh uh, visited Moscow and then flew directly over to Beijing. Uh, that happened on October 20 through October 24th, this five-day trip, two days in Russia, three days in China. And during his uh, visit to Russia, uh, there were uh, a number of agreements were signed, the most important of which were the uh, you know, Ch Russian interest to uh, build four more nuclear power plants in a cluster where they are already built one and the second one is getting built. Uh, but, and the second thing that happened is that India also uh, got from the Russia agreement on which they will jointly do some exploration of oil in Arctic area. And on the strategic side, what they discussed in Russia is basically the uh, importance of keeping Central Asia stable uh, in light of the fact that the Americans, are, Americans and NATO troops will be leaving Afghanistan in 2014 and the place is now uh, infested with uh, terrorists and drug traffickers and uh, with the departure of these troops there's a great deal of fear in the region that uh, these terrorists will turn northwards and eastward that is means towards Russia, towards Indian part of Kashmir and also towards the western part of China which is Xinjiang and also the drug trafficking will create a huge amount of instability throughout the region. So there was this strategic understanding that the stability of Central Asia is necessary for uh, developing the Eurasian land mass. Uh, in China, the discussions were in, uh, mostly bilateral areas, but one important thing that they discussed, which had been discussed before, but this time there seems to be a little more teeth in that, this is the old uh, uh, developing the Kunming to Kolkata, which is formerly known as Calcutta. Kunming to Calcutta, which is from Yunnan province to India via Myanmar, Bangladesh. It's a four nation connected uh, economic corridor, uh, which is also a part of the old Silk Road, in the sense that old Silk Road had many spurs, and this was one of the spurs that existed those days. Uh, Chinese have already spoken extensively with the Bangladeshis and Bangladeshis have agreed very much to go ahead with the project. Uh, Indians uh, obviously uh, agrees to it but the initiative has to come from India and China because neither Myanmar nor Bangladesh has the financial or the physical capability to carry out doing this economic development program, corridor. So that was a very good thing that happened and uh, all these things are still on paper so the until unless these are getting implemented or in the process of getting implemented uh, we cannot say that something concrete has happened. But now this trilateral thing is of extreme importance. Uh, this was recognized by Mr. LaRouche way back in 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed and it opened up the way for Russia to participate very openly with India and China and if you look at the map and if you look at the uh, demography of this area you will find that uh, uh, between Russia, China and India and the, and the area that, is, that these three engulf uh, it's about half of the world's population live there. So the development of this area because of these three giants capabilities uh, would uh, change the world scene uh, rapidly, economic and uh, political and, uh, and social. Um, nonetheless, uh, there were always the problems that existed left over from the Cold War days that Russia was not very well known to the Chinese. And there were a, a lot of uh, uh, animosities existed. Then India-China uh, were always uh, had difficulties because of the 1962 border clash. The border is about 2,300 miles of undemarketed border uh, created by the British Raj and since then it has not been worked out 
and uh, it is a it is a sort of a sticking point uh, between India and China always. And it uh, previously it used to create a situation in which even a war was considered a likely uh, happening. In 1991, Mr. LaRouche talked about this, then another person of substance, uh, Yevgeny uh, Primakov, the Russian Prime Minister, former Russian Prime Minister in 1995 while in Delhi, passing through Delhi, mentioned that India, China, Russia must cooperate in order to uh, take over the, uh, this Eurasian landmass area. In 1999, uh, uh, in New Delhi, a, a triangular association was formed. Uh, it was by uh, the, the signatories, uh, uh, academician Rybakov was the head of the Russian Academy of Science. Uh, Professor Majiali, who was at the time in China, Chinese Institute for uh, at CICIR, Kikir, uh, and uh, an Indian professor who was the head of the uh, School, of Intelli uh, School of International Studies, uh, Dr. Kaushik, and I was the convener, and we started this triangular association. Uh, subsequently, there are a number of things happened which can be given as a reason why this thing didn't move forward very rapidly, or fast enough, uh, was the 2000, uh, the 9-11 in 2001, then the, uh, before that, the Asian, a, a, a significant uh, size Asian financial collapse happened in 1998, then 2009-11 happened, then in 2007, of course, the global economy was tanked, uh, thanks to Wall, um, Wall Street, uh, City of London, and the White House's support the the things got you know got astray a bit um, the, no, but now at this point in time um, there is a perfect uh, situation in which that these three countries should move forward China um, has become more confident now from since 1990s when they were just in the process of getting developed now it's a developed nation almost Russia which is uh, you know as you as you know, is Russia today? I, I think that uh, Forbes has uh, identified uh, Vladimir Putin as the most powerful individual in the world. And <coughs> the, the weakness I see, particularly at this point in time, is in India, where the leadership is extremely weak. Uh, Manmohan Singh is a very weak leader, and uh, moreover, Manmohan Singh is coming to the end, uh, coming to end of his term, and he's already 81 or 82 years old, and uh, this is the end of his political life. <clears throat> However, the, all the basic ingredients for doing this trilateral development is there. Uh, Mr. LaRouche had visited India in 2003, 2004, 2005, and 2008, four times, and every time he was there, of course, the all kinds of issues were uh, uh, under discussion, but he always emphasized that for India has a population of 1.2 billion and it has got a very developed, at least a section of the population is very well developed scientifically and technologically. China has an enormous momentum and China has developed its industries very well. Russia is scientifically probably the, the most advanced nation in the world. Uh, these three, when they get their heads together and their hands together, there is, it is not at all a difficult thing to resolve the Eurasian problem. And once the Eurasia gets developed, and then the effect of the Eurasia comes down to East, which is Southeast Asia, and then Far East, which is Japan and South Korea, who are already developed. When you consider this entire mass coming together for the development of Three to three to uh, two point five to three billion people. Uh, you see that uh, the world is going to undergo a, a massive change, and this trilateral relationship doesn't have to be, as Mr. Larouche has repeatedly pointed out, doesn't have to be uh, uh, in confrontation with the United States. But then again, the United States, uh, the kind of leadership that the United States 
has or had even from the time 2000. Uh, uh, there was very little willingness to participate in the worldwide development and participate with the, with the large nations who they consider as, I mean at least the Wall Street and White House considered as uh, potential uh, uh, adversaries. Therefore, you know, the things didn't develop that way, particularly during, uh, during this present President Obama's time. He has created a situation in which, um, uh, I mean, it started with Bush administration time when the Iraq was attacked, but Obama went on to attack Libya and then created a situation in Syria whereby the entire Muslim, and attacked, uh, invaded Afghanistan, created a situation, the entire Muslim world coming from North Africa all the way to Central Asia. Is, is, is up in arms against uh, uh, outside forces. It is. Uh, uh, it has created a further. It has created further difficulties for India, Russia, and China to develop the economic corridors. Because if you look at the Silk Road, yes, it will start from China. It will go into Central Asia. It will go into Europe. But it has also. It must go into Middle East as well. But if you keep Iran as an enemy and keep the whole entire Arabia in flames, then this economic corridor cannot take place. Uh, secondly, what it does is that, um, um, uh, what it does is that Iran and Arabia, these are the major oil producing, oil and gas producing nations. Both China and India have a great deal of uh, requirements of this oil and gas. Uh, the, by doing this, uh, in, by creating this instability, what has been done is that the potential for these countries to develop uh, fast uh, has been stalled. And in addition to that, recently Obama administration has uh, started another new policy which is basically to confront China which is known as Asia Pivot Policy which is to say that they, uh, which is in the President's word, they are going to now, uh, they have not left Asia, Asia Pacific. In fact, they are going to again concentrate their uh, attention, their strength uh, in Asia Pacific once again. Now China is particularly worried about this because China is now being considered as the number two power and China is located right plonk in the Asia Pacific. And uh, the uh, large-scale American military presence in Asia-Pacific would uh, create a situation in which a confrontation with China uh, could be real and could happen. More importantly, uh, China depends very heavily on importing various uh, natural reserves including uh, oil and gas for daily consumption uh, for 1.3 billion people in China. Uh, and uh, they have to bring this thing by ship from as far as Ibero-America, Africa, Middle East. Uh, and uh, you know, they, there is always a threat with the, with the large presence of U.S. Navy and U.S. presence in Asia Pacific that they can at any point in time, under a pretext of one conflict or the other, they can be uh, the choke points like Malacca Strait, uh, then uh, the Bay of Bengal, then Sunda Strait in Indonesia, these things can be blocked off and China will not be able to sustain itself. So this is, you know, these are, these are the threats that exist, but again, <coughs> these threats are now uh, in a certain way this Asia pivot policy, in my book, it, it, has, uh, it has fizzled out because one of the things that the uh, uh, that Obama administration tried to do is to try to get India, um, uh, create uh, this India's fear about China next door uh, and try to bring uh, India into the American camp. There was an effort was, an effort was made in that direction. However, the Indians rejected it very openly and that is not an issue at this point in time. What is, what is required is basically is that there are a lot of bilateral issues which are, need to be resolved uh, between India, China, uh, India, Russia, China, Russia, I think that most of the difficult issues have been resolved. 
but India China, this 2,300 miles of border, uh, that is a political issue. I mean, uh, until and unless that border issue is settled amicably, the anti China lobby or the pro US lobby within India will continue to pull the government back from a full fledged. Uh, cooperation with China, which is necessary at this point in time. With Russia, the problem with India-Russia is that Russia has so far, India-Russia trade has remained minuscule in size and uh, simply because they have not found a way to develop their uh, mutual dependence. Uh, as, as of now, India is a major purchaser of Russian military hardware and Russia is de definitely very willing to provide as many nuclear power plants that India can absorb. And in fact, you know, Russia has set up some heavy engineering co in collaboration with the Indian uh, industrial facilities, uh, heavy engineering facilities over there, which will be able to build their own nuclear reactors and, uh, and various other equipment that are necessary for nuclear power plants. So. There is, there is, uh, if we genuine, if we, uh, if we uh, talk at the highest level in India, China, and Russia, there is a clear agreement <coughs> that the trilateral cooperation is going to help all three and will stabilize the region. The uh, the things have not moved in that direction very much, but this is still, I consider, a great deal of uh, great deal of uh, uh, advancement that has happened. Because in 1999, after that formation of trilateral uh, uh, triangular association, I had a press conference with all these three um, uh, individuals. Indian press uh, was absolutely shocked to hear that such a thing could be done because Russia, China, they had their own border war during the Soviet days. India, China had their border wars in 1962. Uh, how come this difficult uh, animosities uh, developed over the years could be overcome? Uh, but but this is uh, this I think is a what has what we have succeeded in doing over the years. Mr. Larouche, of course, is the leader. Uh, is that there is a clear understanding now in Russia and China and India that the triangular uh, trilateral cooperation, however difficult uh, it is to bring into fruition. Uh, is a, is the most important thing that is to be done in order to stabilize the region, uh, uh, each country m m getting the maximum benefit out of it, and uh, and, us, uh, and also to uh, politically stabilize the world. Uh, because there is a recognition, uh, which was not there again, that this is a multipolar world. Previous understanding was that uni it's a unipolar world, United States is so powerful that uh, no other power will be able to emerge in, uh, from under its shadow. But over the years, the collapse of the U.S. economy, the collapse of the U.S. policy, the mistakes and uh, failures of the U.S. foreign policy has uh, made these people at the highest level to realize that, uh, and China's growth, uh, that there is, uh, there is, uh, this is a multipolar world and we, they can play a stellar role in uh, taking over from the United States the responsibility of stabilizing a vast section of the world and you know eventually when United States gets an adequate leadership uh, United States can join and that is the only way this world can be stabilized. Thank you.